four times in the verses that we looked at last week, the first verses of chapter 3, four times Paul uses the word mystery to describe what God is all about and what God is up to in our day, what God is doing, what God's agenda is. He uses this word mystery to unveil the plan and the purpose of God for us in our day. And he tells us in those verses to the shock of his original audience that the mystery of the gospel is the indiscriminate promiscuity of God's love for sinners of all stripes. That's what God is up to. Okay, that that God is up to a promiscuous distribution of his infallible, unconditional love to sinners of all stripes, that God came for the religiously self-righteous and the irreligiously unrighteous, that regardless of who you are or where you've come from or what you've done, good or bad, every single one of us are identical at the point of need. Sinners in need of grace. And I mentioned last week that this was a shocker to Paul's original audience. This idea that God was for the Gentiles as much as he was for the Jews was a shocker in Paul's day. It was, it was a cultural shocker that Gentile people, non-Jewish people, had equal access to God because of what Jesus has done. This is Paul explaining exactly what happened when the veil was torn from top to bottom. Top to bottom, not bottom to top. Top to bottom because it was God doing the tearing and ripping open the veil so that all sinners would have equal access to him because of what Jesus has done. And Paul's point here is that while our sin reaches far, God's grace reaches farther, and as is always the case with God's grace, it reaches in some pretty surprising directions. I mean, that's always the way it is with grace. Grace always, always, always comes as a surprise. I mean, we are so, every single one of us are so hardwired for earning and merit and deservedness that no one has to teach us to believe that God is for the clean and competent. That's what we naturally believe. We understand that God is holy and we are unholy, that God is perfect and we are unperfect, and it just makes sense to us, natural sense to us, that because God is good and holy and righteous and just, that He is for the clean, He is for the competent. But what Paul wants to make clear here is that God's one-way love comes only to the unclean and the incompetent because unclean and incompetent people are all that there is. And that was, that was a big deal to his original audience because the Jewish people, the Israelites, had a unique and special relationship to God. We read about that all throughout the Old Testament. It was to the Israelites, it was to the Jews that God gave the law and the prophets. God established a covenantal relationship with the Jewish people, with the Israelites. And so now for them to hear that all of this, and Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 9, but that all of this, all of God's grace and goodness is for people of all stripes, it's not simply located to one people group, was a big deal in Paul's day. It was scandalous. It was shocking. Well, in these verses now, Paul moves from preaching to prayer, and then ultimately to praise in verse 20 and 21. And the purpose of Paul's prayer is clear. It's very clear. It's It's not hard to understand what the purpose of Paul's prayer here is. His his purpose is that they may be able to comprehend the depth and extent of God's love for them. The prayer is simply, in other words, that they would get the gospel. That's his prayer. 
that they would get the gospel, that they would understand the gospel, that the gospel would be massaged by God down deep into their bones. Paul prays that Christians will know the love of Christ, that they will be rooted and grounded in love. And then this prayer leads straight to worship in verses 20 to 21. And what's fascinating to me about the flow of this passage is it really does give us a snapshot of what the Christian life is all about. Preach the gospel, pray that the gospel will be understood at a real functional level, and then praise the God of the gospel. That's the, that's the rhythm of the Christian life. Preach the gospel, Pray that the gospel will be experienced, understood, and known at a deep, real, felt, and functional level, and then praise the God of the gospel. You know, I've said this before, but the only antidote to sin is the gospel, is God's grace. So as long as you and I remain sinners, As long as there is still sin in us and in this world, we never ever grow past our need to hear the gospel. We never ever grow past our need to be reminded of God's unconditional love for us, to be reminded of His scandalous grace and His outrageous mercy. We never ever outgrow that. We never get to a point in our Christian life where we say, okay, we got that. Can you stop telling us about that? I've had people say that to me, and I said, are you still a sinner? And when they respond by saying yes, I said, well, this is the only medicine God offers for sin. So as long as you remain a sinner, you remain in need of this message. You remain in need of the scandalous gospel of grace. Well, throughout Ephesians, throughout the entire letter, Paul preaches this robust, 200-proof, unfiltered gospel. He has from the very beginning. I mean, from the start of chapter one, he has been preaching a 200-proof, non-watered-down, unfiltered gospel. Robust. Okay, I mean, he's been preaching it in a scandalous, paradigm-shattering way. And what's interesting about this, and this is something that is all too often overlooked, is that he's preaching this to Christians. You know, I've said this so many times that if I had a dime for every time I said it, I'd be a multimillionaire. But the fact of the matter is that most people inside the church, at least this was my experience inside the church, hear the word gospel and they think, oh, that's for people outside the church. The gospel is synonymous with evangelism only. And once God saves us, he moves us beyond the gospel into something else. Call it discipleship, call it whatever. Okay, God moves us beyond that. The gospel is really just the ABCs of the Christian faith. Can we move on? And Sometimes they point back to Paul saying, you guys can't handle meat, so I have to continue giving you milk. And um, I have to remind them that the meat that Paul's talking about there is a deeper understanding of the gospel, not movement past it. It's not like, okay, we got the gospel, now can we move on to the deeper waters of the Christian faith? There are no deeper waters to the Christian faith. And what's so often overlooked is when Paul writes these letters and he preaches this gospel. He's always doing it to Christians. That fact alone should be enough for us to go, okay, if the Apostle Paul, Super Saint Apostle Paul, felt the need to preach the gospel in a robust, unfiltered way to Christian people, how in the world could we ever conclude that it's something we grow past? Well, I was reminded of why this is so important to remember when I read this testimony a few weeks ago. This comes from a guy who grew up in church, good, solid, evangelical church, uh, went on staff for many, many years at a good, solid parachurch ministry, one that all of you guys, most of you guys, some of you guys, a couple of you guys would know, all right? Um, And this is what he wrote, okay? This was his testimony. My Christian life, truly begun in grace, 
was now being perfected on the treadmill of performance. My pastors did not end their sermons by demanding that I recite the rosary or visit Lourdes that week in order to unleash God's power. Instead, I was told to yield more, pray more, care more about unbelievers, read the Bible more, get involved in church more, and love my wife and kids more. Okay, that's sort of the Protestant version of works righteousness that is all too often preached from pulpits in America. Okay, it's, it's uh, you know, people moan and groan, especially if you grew up in Roman Catholic Church, moan and groan about the fact that, you know, it just seems like inside the Catholic Church, we, and I hear this from people on a regular basis, I grew up inside the Catholic Church and there was just so much emphasis on what we needed to do in order to get God to like us, in order to clean up our act and get God to love us. And, you know, we Protestants go, I know, we're not guilty of that at all. We are, we just have a different version. We're not telling people to you know, rub their rosaries or as he says, make a trip to Lord's to impress God, but we have our own versions of it. It's simply do more, try harder. We have our own versions of it. He goes on and says, not until I came to the realization 20 years later that the gospel is just as necessary after you become a Christian as it was before, did I understand that my Christian life had come to center around me and my performance, my life, my obedience, my yielding, my Bible verse memorization, my prayers, my zeal, my witnessing, my sermon application. I had advanced beyond the need to hear the cross preached to me anymore. At least that's what he thought. Now, he's not saying any of these things are bad at all. They're good. They're necessary. They're right. It's when we start to believe that it's those things that keep us in God's good graces that we slowly drift into a works-based faith that's all about me and what I do instead of a grace-based faith that's all about Jesus and what he's done. He goes on to say, what had my evangelical training done to me? The gospel was critical for me at the beginning, critical for me to share with others, and still critical to get me into heaven. But other than that, it was of little value. The evangel and evangelicalism was missing. My training inside the church had me on a treadmill of merit. Now, when I first read that, I've read similar testimonies like that. But when I read that again, I said, that, that describes me. And with no bad intention on the part of any preacher or my Christian school upbringing or my parents or anything like that, I mean, no one was out to try and convince me that I had to do more and try harder to keep God loving me. No one had to convince me of that, but I'm a sinner. I'm addicted to self-salvation projects. We all are. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. That's, that's our experience of the curse. We all are. No one has to teach us this stuff. And so if we aren't careful inside the church, in our relationships, in our small groups, behind the pulpit, in our counseling, all of those things, to remind people that this whole thing is riding on Jesus, we will naturally conclude that it's riding on us. As my friend Justin Buzzard says, this is so good, he said, Christianity should feel like my chains fell off, not I better not mess up. And to be honest with you, um, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that I ran from God and ran from the church when I was 16 years old and even before that was because my understanding of the Christian faith was simply, don't screw up. And I knew that I was a screw up. <laughs> you know? I mean, Christianity just isn't for me. Christianity is for clean cut, competent people. People, you know, people who for the most part have it together. It's not for me. I mean, I'm, I'm a wild man. Christianity's not for wild men. You know, it's not for people, I, well, I don't know if this is true for you, but um, I love life, really do. I'm an extrovert, I love life, I, I love having fun, uh, but life doesn't come easy to me. 
I mean, I'm always struggling with me. I have since the moment I came into this world. I mean, for some people, life just seems to come easier. My oldest sister, Bibi, it's her nickname. We all have nicknames. Bibi, Stefan was Teton, Tullian was Tutu, Basil was Boz. Okay, I mean, you have to, don't tell anybody that my nickname was Tutu. <laughs> Most people know that already. Um, it's terribly embarrassing. Um, the reason my nickname was Tutu is because my older brothers and sisters could not say Tullian. So my dad decided to brand me with a nickname that would make it easier for my brothers and sisters to refer to me, thinking that it would go away by the time I was five or six years old. I'm 40 now, and my brothers and sisters, when they text or call, still call me Tutu. My, my nieces and nephews call me Uncle Tutu, okay? Right, Hope? Oh. A little strange. Um, but um, I don't even know what I, oh, my oldest sister, Bibi. Um, I mean, life just seems to have come easier for her. You know, she's always done the right thing. She's always made good grades. She never had to study very hard to make good grades. She actually graduated high school a year early, went to college a year early. I mean, she was, you know, she, it just seemed, her kids are perfect, you know? I mean, not really, but they're smart and nice and sophisticated and, you know, I mean, it's, um, you, I just look at her, her husband's just a really nice guy, you know? I mean, I, he's just a nice guy. Look at her, so you're, just a, you're just a nicer person than I am. I mean, by nature. It just, life just comes easier or it seems to come easier for some people. I was never that way. You know, everything was a struggle. You say black, I say white. Why? I don't know. I wish I could just agree with you, but I can't. Um, you know, I mean, it just, it's just harder. You know, everything's, everything's a struggle. Well, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that I ran away from the Christian faith is because I just didn't think it was for people like me. I mean, I just, you know, it, in the Christian faith, as Justin Buzzard says, what a name, huh? Love it, Buzzard. Um, if you're listening, Justin, it's a terrible name. Um, just has the stench of death all about it. Um, but I mean, his point that Christianity should feel, it should feel. And a lot of it's the responsibility of preachers to help Christianity feel like my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Not, I better not screw up. Okay, which is, which is the way we naturally feel. We are inclined to think that the gospel gets us in, and then we move on to the meat of applying timeless principles, you know? I mean, we just, we are so, so inclined to always fighting against the reality that God and His gospel is enough. It's just so natural for us to buck against the idea that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, that God and his gospel are enough. We either want to add ourselves on the front end, self-justification, or we want to add ourselves on the back end, self-sanctification. Somewhere in the paradigm, we have to insert ourselves. We must insert ourselves. We feel compelled to insert ourselves. I mean, we think we can do God's job before we're Christians, and so we try to justify ourselves. And once we crash and burn trying to do that, then once we become Christians, we think we can make it on our own with a little divine guidance. Self-sanctification. That's, that's what exists inside the church more than anything. You won't talk to too many Protestants who think that, okay, I get it, Jesus plus nothing equals everything when it comes to getting us in. But once we're in, you know, I re-enter. You know, I'm, I'm called off the bench. Justification gets me, gets me on the team. Thank you, God, for getting me on the team. But now it's up to me to get off the bench. Okay, that's the way we typically think about it. I mean, most Christians are happy to let God justify us, but the day after we become a Christian, we fall back into the death trap of self-salvation, only now we call it 
sanctification. The Bible has wonderful, great things, as you'll see in a minute. Um, it says wonderful things about sanctification, but what we sinners do with it <laughs> becomes incredibly enslaving. I mean, as I said, God's work gets us on the team, but our work gets us off the bench. Now, what we discover here is that salvation, and we saw this in the beginning in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I mean, salvation from start to finish is a work of God. Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 8 when he's describing the golden chain of salvation. And my friend Mark, Mike Horton says, there are no fingerprints on that chain. Notice, from, from, from eternity past to eternity future, this is all God's work. And Paul, and, and listen, and I know the struggle. I know the struggle, because I have it too. It's like, okay, yeah, but, I mean, I, w w but where, okay, just be quiet, all right? I mean, it's what Gerhard Ferdy says, for once, just shut up and listen to what God says about you. All right, you're in. That becomes the fuel and the motivating force that gets you to live life for other people, that gets you to sacrifice yourself for others instead of spending your life sacrificing others for yourself. Whenever the Bible describes good works, it describes sacrificial, loving service to your neighbor, whoever that is, your spouse. And we'll get into that when we get uh, later on in this book as Paul talks about relationships between husbands and wives and uh, co-workers and employees and employers and parents with children and children with parents and all of the unique dynamic relationships that all of us experience on a daily basis. Uh, none, of, none of this is even possible, the kind of sacrifice, the kind of loving sacrifice that Paul describes in those verses that we'll get to in a couple of weeks only happens as we come to understand that everything we need in Christ we have, that in terms of the vertical dynamic between God and us, it's finished. No more do we have to work to get God's favor. No more do we go to our Bibles and have our quiet times because if we don't, then God's going to be chapped with us all day long, okay? That's not why we, if that's why you're reading the Bible, it's a self-salvation project, okay? I mean, we read the Bible so that as we encounter God's Word in it, as we read what God has told sinners, we realize once again that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and then He describes for us what life on the ground looks like in service to our neighbor. So even here in Ephesians, Paul spends the first three chapters just hammering home the gospel, 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 gospel. And then he begins in chapter four and says, okay, now what is, what is a life gripped by this gospel look like on the ground? It's what it is. We don't, we don't love our neighbor and we don't pray and we don't read our Bible and we don't do all these things to keep us in God's good graces. That's what I did for so many years after I became a Christian. I, I have to journal three pages, not one. I have to pray for an hour, not 20 minutes. I have to read four chapters of the Bible a day, not one chapter. And I'm telling you, I said this a few weeks ago, I'm telling you, I mean, on the days that I would get up at you know, seven instead of 6.30, and read one chapter instead of three, and maybe skip a day of journaling, okay? And, um, you know, my prayer was shorter and more spotty. I mean, I liter literally went through the entirety of those days feeling like God was annoyed with me. Well, what's happened in that moment? I, I started to view good spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible reading and journaling and those sorts of things, things that I think are necessary and good. Those are the rendezvous points where God comes to meet us. That's where he meets us and tells us who he is and who we are and all of those things. But I had turned those rendezvous points into self-salvation outposts. That's where I would go to make sure God still liked me. Mark Galley, who was here at Liberate, uh, said, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that if you, you know, if, if, you, um, if you become a Christian because 
you want to change, that's the goal, that's the primary motivation, then you're, you're, that's not love for God, that's love for self. That's using God to make you into a better you. All right, and that's the way I had turned all of these good things that God has called us to do and have uh, given us the privilege of participating in. The problem is this, this passage won't stand for either self-justification or self-sanctification. Okay, it just won't stand for it. Um, it won't stand for either of those. The goal of Paul's prayer, and notice this, the goal of Paul's prayer is that Christians would comprehend the outrageous love of God. That's the goal of his prayer. And then notice that this comprehension is no human achievement. This doesn't happen. This comprehension does not happen by you working hard to get it. He says very clearly, it happens through the Spirit. Verse 16, very plainly he says, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, gift you, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. That verse paints the picture of you being 100% recipient. Okay, and then notice in verse, uh, verse 20, now to him who is able to do, that's God, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think according to the power at work within us. Well, that power is God's power, not yours. It's God's might, not yours. We are on the receiving end of power from above, not power from within. It's not the power that is at work within us comes from outside of us. It comes from who God is and what God has done. So in theological terms, bear with me here, Paul sees sanctification as an act of the Spirit that grounds the Christian in the love of Jesus. So if you want an Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21 definition of sanctification, and the Bible presents a variety of definitions in different places. Paul uses different ways to say the same thing. But if you want a definition of sanctification from these verses, it's simply this. Sanctification is being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. It's what it is. In other words... Christian growth, whatever you think about the nature of Christian growth or the definition of Christian growth, Christian growth is an ever-deepening, spirit-wrought apprehension of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. That's what it is. It is not, Christian growth is not getting more of God's love. It is apprehending the love of God that has already directed your way minus your merit inexhaustible. It's an ever-deepening spirit-wrought apprehension of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. And this is precisely what Jesus said the Spirit would come and do. Remember in John 15? He says, I'm leaving. Okay, I'm, I'm going. Uh, and I know that sounds like bad news to you disciples, but I have good news. I am, I am sending the comforter. I am... I, I'm, Jesus is fully God, fully man, God in the flesh, which means Jesus can only be in one place at one time. So he says, I've got good news for you. I'm sending the Spirit, the Comforter, because in that way I will be able to be with all of you all of the time. My, my presence will be spiritual and I will be with you at all times. And he says, this is what the Spirit's coming to do. If you want a job description, there's so much confusion regarding the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know why there's so much confusion because Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit's job description as plain as day. In John 15, he says, the Spirit will come to testify about me. That's why one of my theology professors in seminary, Doug Kelly, called the Holy Spirit the humility of God. He's never, ever bringing attention to himself, ever. 
The Holy Spirit is always shining the light on Jesus. He comes to testify to him. The work of God's Spirit inside of us is to daily convince us of the work of God's Son outside of us. And his testimony about Jesus is not some generic testimony. Can't sound like, yeah, Jesus. It's a very, very specific testimony that Paul outlines here. It's not some generic testimony about Jesus and who he is and what he's done and what he looks like and that sort of thing, that he's powerful, okay, that he does miracles. That's not the kind of testimony the Holy Spirit is sent to give us. The specific testimony that God sent his Spirit to give us inside of us is simply this. You are loved. That's what he says. I mean, he makes it very, very clear. The whole, the, the ministry and the role of the Holy Spirit is to preach one constant, continuous sermon inside Christians, which is simply this. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. It's true. It's true. It's true. And the reason we need that is because our greatest problem is unbelief. We just, we don't believe it, you know? I mean, I just, knowing the mess that I am, it's so difficult to believe that God's love for me is unconditional and unwavering. I mean, I mentioned a number of weeks ago that it's one thing to say, Jesus is love, or God is love. That's generic, you know, that's sort of out there. But for me to say, God loves me, it's much harder. It's much harder for, for it to become personal and for me to say, okay, I mean, I've been a Christian for 20 years and I've been trained in college and graduate school to understand the Bible and I've been preaching for 15 of those years and, or a little bit longer and been inside the church and grew up around ministry, grew up around Christian people and grew up in good churches, all of that stuff. I mean, I, I am a prime candidate to be a believer in the fact that God loves me, and it's just impossible to believe. I've said this before, that Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and following are the hardest verses for Christian people to believe. It's just so hard that nothing ever can separate us from God's love. We get that intellectually, but you don't get it functionally. I don't. If you do, you're better than me, and you don't need the gospel anymore, and you'll be, you know, zapped to heaven, I'm sure, in a matter of seconds. Um, but I mean, I, we just don't, it's, we don't believe it. And all of our problems, one of the reasons this is so important, the reason this is so important is because all of our problems are rooted in our failure to believe that we are deeply loved. All of them. I mean, all of them. I, uh, we have staff devotions on Tuesday mornings, and Leo Riley, our children's pastor, was doing the devotions, and he says he remembers being in seminary and hearing one of his practical theology uh, professors, Jack Miller, who's now dead. He's the one who was famous for saying, cheer up, you're a lot worse off than you think you are, but yeah, God's grace is infinitely larger than you could ever hope for or imagine. Uh, it's a great description of the Bible as a whole. What's the Bible all about? That. Uh, but he says, I can remember, Leo said, I can remember sitting in class and, um, and he would talk, Jack Miller would talk about the sin beneath the sin, and he used as an example lying. All of us lie. Okay, you don't think you lie. If you're sitting there and going, I, I'm not a liar, well, you're lying to yourself right now, okay? So, um, I mean, we all lie in a variety of ways. If you, you know, if you don't make distinctions between little white lies and big lies and exaggeration and blah, 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 okay? But, I mean, we all do it, okay? And he said that Jack Miller was using this as an example. He says, take lying, for instance. He said, I mean, we just, we can't help but lie in a variety of different ways. He said, but why do we lie? You ever ask yourself, why do you lie? Why do you embellish? Why do you exaggerate? Why? Why? Well, the real reason is because we're trying to get approval. We're trying to earn approval. We're trying to, in a sense, in that particular instance, earn love and earn respect. And we're 
we're trying to save ourselves in that moment. There's a self-salvation project at work in that moment where if, if I can get this person to believe what I'm telling them, I will feel like I matter more than I do right now. Okay, so that's just one example of many, 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 many when you start looking at the sin beneath the sin, it's all the result of our thirst for love and approval and those sorts of things. So the reason Paul harps on this is because he recognizes that all of our problems, relational and otherwise, are rooted in our failure to believe that we are deeply loved. I mean, the fact that God knows my sin and knows my secrets, and yours too, and we all got them. Okay, I've said this before. There are, there are things about you whether they be thoughts or emotions or actions or past history or whatever, there are things about you that you hope no one finds out about, that you hope no one finds out about. I mean, this may be something from, you know, when you were a teenager or well, who knows, okay? It's better just to believe the gospel and confess your sin publicly so that there are no secrets like I try to do, but um, there, we all got them. And this idea that God, God sees my sin and he knows my secrets, and he sees me. He really, really sees me. He doesn't just see the part that I want you guys to see. He sees me. He sees me more than I see me. And the fact that God knows my sin and my secrets and that he sees me, that he really sees me and still says, I know you and I love you, is impossible to believe. It's not just hard to believe, okay? It's impossible to believe, which is why sanctification or Christian growth cannot be a human work because it's impossible. I can't believe that. I, do you understand what, what the world would look like if simply the church and the people who make up the church believe with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength that all of the love and approval and affection and acceptance that they long for, they already possessed in Christ. So now they could literally, literally spend, not just practically, but emotionally, psychologically, they could literally spend every moment of their life giving instead of taking. You know what that would look like? It would change everything. The fact that that's not yet the case, and, you know, to be honest, won't be until Jesus comes back, is one more proof that we need to hear this over and over and over again. I mean, it's just, it's impossible for me to believe that nothing I do or don't do can ever separate me from God's love. The idea that I can never, ever, ever out sin, the coverage of God's love, <laughs> seems too good to be true. This is why it takes a work of God, <laughs> which is why what is impossible with man is possible only with God. This, this has to be a work of God. It has to be a work of God because you guys, you and I are not going to wake up tomorrow morning and pull ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps and say, today is the day that I believe. It doesn't happen, okay? It, does, it doesn't, today, I'm really going to be serious about it today. I mean, I'm going to get up and I am going to be focused and determined to believe as if belief is up to you. That's why Paul says in these verses, this is spirit wrought faith in what Jesus has done. It's, it's faith, and as we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, this, this faith itself is not, is not a work, it's a, it's a gift from God. Okay, the belief, to whatever degree our spotty belief, our inconsistent belief, our in a, to the degree that we are capable, even if it's small, to believe that God really does love us, that's a gift from God. <laughs> It doesn't, it's not mustered up within us. That, that's, why that, that's why it takes a work of the Spirit. It takes the work of the Spirit inside of us, convincing us of God the Son's work outside of us. 
Okay, that's, that's what it is. It's God the Spirit inside going, look away from yourself and look to Jesus. Okay, the moment you start looking inside yourself, that's when it's easy to conclude, how could, how could God ever love me? There's no way. Look at Jesus and the love that was supremely displayed on the cross for bad people. Not good people, because bad people are all that there are. Look at the cross and look at what Jesus came to do, not for the clean and the competent, but for the unclean and the incompetent. I mean, the idea that God's love has no limits and is directed to me personally blows my mind. In fact, it's so unbelievable that I have to be reconvinced of it every single day. You know, America produces self-made people. You know, some of you may, may be that. You know, you've experienced success, you've, you've worked hard, and you've achieved, and you've experienced success, and you are now enjoying the fruits of your labor. You know, you were determined, you were focused, you, were, you weren't one of those guys who was wasting their life in high school and college, and um, you know, you weren't one of those girls that was spending her life trying to attract guys. I mean, you were focused, you know, you were determined to live right, to stay on the tracks. And, you know, you succeeded. In, in, in some of your cases, you, you succeeded. And, you know, you've got, you've got things pretty well in order, and you live life with the philosophy that if you just work hard, you can accomplish anything. The problem is when we translate that into our relationship to God. That's the problem, and that's the default mode that all of us have, which is why we are kept from believing that we really are train wrecks as far as God is concerned. Because we look at life on the ground horizontally and we go, I mean, I've been married for 25 years. I got three kids, none of them are on drugs. All of them have gone to relatively decent schools. I've made some money, I've, I've worked hard, I started off on the bottom, I've made my way to the top. I mean, you know, this is, I get how, the thing, I get how this all works. Do good things, get good stuff, all right? And then we counsel people like this. You want to get the good stuff, just do good things. That's Job's friends. You want all the good stuff back? Clean up your act. Okay? And what happens is we begin to translate that into our relationship with God, and as a result, we fail to see our helpless need. It's hard. It's hard for successful people to realize how desperate they are. I was told about a guy that I just briefly met. Um... Uh, this was, I was told this a few days ago, but this was a guy that I only met briefly one time, 32 years old, kind of like me uh, in the sense that life always came hard for him, you know, and um, tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and um, ended up, he was, a, he was a heavy, heavy drinker. That's not like me, by the way. I uh, never liked this stuff. Um, but... Um, but, you know, he was a heavy drinker and would go through periods where he would, you know, binge drink and then he would get sober and then he would binge drink and then he would get sober. And uh, tragically, last week, okay, he was in the Ukraine to visit uh, his new daughter uh, that he had with a girl that he met over there um, and uh, drank too much and wandered out into uh, the cold weather and froze to death. 32 years old, okay? Um, and his mother called the office and asked if she could speak to me. And so they took a message, and I called her back a couple hours later. And she was so, it was an unbelievably sweet, sweet testimony from her about um, her son and how uh, the only time he actually ever felt that God not just loved him, but liked him, it was over the last two or three months coming to Coral Ridge, okay? He'd been out of church for a while, and had a friend invite him back, and, um, and she just said he just struggled so, so much, and he hated it when he failed. And he just felt like there was no way God could ever love him when he was failing, that God's love was reserved for him when he was succeeding. And she started to describe the nature of his struggle and the the ways that he would cry out to God for help in complete desperation. And I said to her on the phone, I said, you know, I've been a pastor now for quite some time. And um, it, it's hard 
When I run into people for whom life has been relatively easy and they've experienced some success, it's just really, really hard for those people to see how desperate they are for Jesus. It's just hard. You know, I mean, I just, I, it's just so difficult. The people that I have met whose relationship with Jesus is sweet are the people who understand their desperation at a deep felt level. And if you look around, okay, at the success in your life and how things are going and conclude that I'm not like them, you know, I've just, I've never been, I've never been a drinker. I would never wander out having binge drink into the cold and freeze to death, much less get some girl pregnant and have a child out of wet. I mean, I just, that's just not me at all. I've kept myself clean then you're the older brother who just can't seem to understand the desperation that you are and how needy you are for Jesus. And so this is what Paul's, it's what Paul's up to here. That's why he's praying this prayer. I'm just praying, praying that you would realize that before God, you are a helpless, needy, naked sinner. And until you realize that, you'll never, ever come to deeply appreciate and fall in love with Jesus. I want you to comprehend God's love for you. If if you didn't need God's love a lot, but only a little, how can you comprehend that? Remember what Jesus said? Those who have been forgiven much, love much. He wasn't saying that there are some people who are forgiven a little bit because they're good, and some people are forgiven a lot because they're bad, and these people love Jesus more. He's saying, (laughs) understand that before God, Every Christian has been forgiven much. I mean, every single one of us, as I mentioned last week, are identical at the foot of the cross, identical at the point of need. It's only when we realize that that we come to understand and appreciate the remarkable grace of God. Charles Spurgeon said this. I love this quote. Forgiving love is God's main instrument in transforming people. Forgiving love, not butt-kicking, okay, tongue-lashing, whipping, okay. The law does that work, but that's not what transforms you. That's just what breaks you down. What transforms you is gospel, grace. Forgiving love is God's main instrument in transforming men. Let me just stop for a second. I'm a parent. Many of you are parents. Do we believe this? I mean, seriously, what is it that transforms people? I'm a pastor and a preacher, so I've got plenty. I'm pastor, preacher, parent, the three deadly Ps. I'm all of those things. That's why my hair is as gray as it is, by the way, Um, and uh, which I looked in the mirror yesterday. I was like, it really, I might have to highlight it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Just kidding. The moment I do that, if I stand up here with highlights in my hair, I give every single one of you permission to come up here and slap me in the face, all right? Um, But we just don't believe that. I mean, when I think as a preacher and a parent, what is it that transforms people? It's a couple slaps here, a couple words of rebuke there. That's what really transforms hearts of people, you know? I mean, the Bill Parcells approach to preaching and parenting. Smack them around, make them scared, their hearts will be changed. How's that working for you, seriously? I mean, if you're doing that with your kids only, they may be well-behaved because they don't want to get punished anymore, but I can promise you their hearts are far from you, all right? Because I've tried it. Um, I've tried it, and you probably have too. Maybe you've done it with your spouse. If I just tell them 10,000 times over and 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 over again, maybe his heart will well up with desire to pick up his clothes, you know? If I just tell her over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, then maybe, you know, her heart will well up with desire and she'll start you know, respecting me, okay? It's, why don't you respect me? I'm the leader in this home. Oh my gosh, honey, I, f- forgive me. I, gosh, I, I'm sorry, I want to. Has that ever happened in the history of mankind? Never, okay? The law doesn't do that. That's what the Bible says, the law doesn't have the power to do that. 
I mean, it can say, hey, husbands love your wives, but it can't make you love your wife. Only grace does that. It can say, wives, submit to your husbands, but the law can't make you want to submit to your husband. Only grace can do that. Okay, I mean, all of these things, it's a proper distinction between what the law does and what the gospel does. So Spurgeon, understanding this, says, forgiving love is God's main instrument in transforming men. Forgiving love. Free pardon, I love this line, free pardon is a great conqueror. Men are hardened rather than softened by a sense of condemnation aren't they? Who wants to be around you if you're constantly criticizing? It is, criticism doesn't change people. Even constructive criticism doesn't change people, okay? I mean, it, does criticism, has criticism ever changed anyone at the heart level? No, because it can't, okay? It can't. I'm not saying that we don't need to be critical at times, but that's the role of the law, not the gospel. Okay, to think that criticism has the power to change someone, it just doesn't. Men are hardened rather than softened by a sense of condemnation. Let me just add this too. I mean, one of, um, I, I was just not an easy student, you know, in my growing up days. And I went to Christian schools and because I couldn't sit still, um, and because I couldn't, you know, I just wasn't timely in doing my homework and, you know, that sort of stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't in probably maybe fourth or fifth grade that I was kind of labeled, you know, kind of the, the troublemaker, the bad kid. And to be quite honest with you, I wasn't even really doing anything troublesome or bad at that point in my life. I mean, it was just, you know, I just, I just didn't fit the mold. And by the time I was 13, 14 years old, I just, well, forget it, you know? I've been condemned to the status of troublemaker. I might as well go out and make some real trouble, all right? I mean, this is, this is what Spurgeon's talking about. Men are hardened rather than softened by a sense of condemnation, but remove the burden of their guilt, and they will be dissolved by love. Well, this prayer spills into praise in verse 20 and 21, which means that a life of worship is produced by focusing on God's love for sinners. Paul says this. He, I mean, Spurgeon basically summarizes this right here. Love for God, I mean, God's love for you, fixating on God's love for you is what changes people. It softens hard hearts makes us more forgiving, makes us more loving toward our neighbor, makes us more patient with people. I'll close with this. Um, Paul Zoll, who is also here at Liberate, uh, gives this testimony of his own life. He says, back a number of years ago, my doing of the good deeds that Jesus taught in the Bible actually hinged on him saving me and loving me. I had previously found myself paralyzed and blocked from doing all of those good deeds. But when I felt myself loved in my chains, in my paralysis, that feeling of being loved seemed to trigger the very motivation and strength that had failed me before. Being treated forgivingly in my faults and fears freed me up. The faults themselves lost some of their binding strength. The confirming fears ceased to restrict so tightly. There was an empowering connection between Jesus saving me, who he was for me, and the fuel to do what he said I should do. I take this connection between saving and the response to being saved that results in morally good actions or loving service to our neighbor to be the heart of Christianity. It is the relation of being loved to loving. Being loved creates an environment inside a person by which the works of love begin to take place naturally. Loving is born from being loved. Or, an old 17th century way of saying it, love to the loveless shown that they might be lovelier still. This is what he's getting at. And so what I want to do to 
end um, this morning is I want to go back and I want to pray this prayer for you and for me. Specifically, gear it (laughs) to you, the people of this church, to me. So let's, with Paul in timeless manner, pray, pray along with me. I mean, not out loud, just in your hearts, okay, because I'm going to add some words here so you won't know what I'm going to say. Um, but for this reason, I bow my knees before you, O oh God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, that you would grant the people of Coral Ridge, every person in this room, that you would grant us strength with power through your Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through the faith that you have given, so that we, being rooted and grounded in this one-way love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the Christians who have gone before us, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of this remarkable love, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses mere intellectual knowledge and assent, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God.